Chapter 32 in Concepts, Coping. When an individual experiences physiological or psychological stress, a response is needed to adapt or modify the impact of the stressor. Considering the large number and variety of stressors that humans experience throughout the lifespan, it should be no surprise that a wide variety of responses occur. Some responses are helpful and some are not. Coping is a multifaceted concept involving human cognition, individual perception, and behavior. In nursing, understanding the concept of coping as a relationship between the person and the environment is an important component of care delivery. The definition of coping in nursing has not yet reached a consensus. Research in the area of coping has studied this concept from a number of perspectives. One of the classic definitions of coping is from Lazarus and Folkman, two theorists who describe coping as an ever-changing process involving both cognitive means and behavioral actions in order to manage internal or external situations that are perceived as difficult and or beyond the individual's current resources. When the internal or external demands of the environment surpass current resources, the individual will attempt to maintain equilibrium by utilizing coping strategies. Ray and colleagues define coping as being action-oriented toward a goal of changing a situation. In other words, the conscious or unconscious behaviors of an individual to avoid harm and restore balance. Peel further defined coping as abstract thoughts based on past experiences to reduce stress. It is apparent from the varying definitions that coping represents continual changes in behavior and cognition in order to modify or adapt the person-environment relationship to reduce stress. This adaptation or modification requires conscious thought, a key differentiator from a psycho physiological reflex or a psychological defense mechanism. Coping is based on individual perception, relationship to the environment, and evaluation of the environment, as well as availability of resources. Furthermore, an individual's control over internal and external demands has an impact on coping and change. Describe and define the concept is your objectives, notice risk factors for altered coping responses, recognize when an individual has maladaptive coping, provide appropriate nursing and collaborative interventions to optimize the coping responses and minimize maladaptive coping. The scope of the concept ranges from effective, adaptive to ineffective. Cognitive assessment. Responding to stress begins with a cognitive assessment or evaluation of the situation in relation to the individual. This assessment represents the process of sorting out information to derive meaning and is the underlying factor in how an individual re will respond. Research in the area of coping has studied this concept from a number of perspectives. One of the classic definitions of coping is from Lazarus and Folkman who described coping as an ever-changing process involving both cognitive means and behavioral actions in order to manage internal or external stimuli that are perceived as difficult and or beyond the individual's current resources. When the internal or external demands of the environment surpass current resources, the individual will attempt to maintain equilibrium by utilizing coping strategies. Ray and colleagues define coping as being action-oriented toward a goal of changing a situation. The unconscious or conscious behaviors of an individual to avoid harm and restore balance. Keel, another theorist, defined coping as abstract thoughts based on past experiences to reduce stress. It is apparent from the varying definitions that coping represents continual changes in behavior and cognition in order to modify or adapt the person-environmental relationship to reduce stress. This adaptation or modification requires conscious thought, a key differentiator from a physiological reflex or psychological defense mechanism. Coping is based on individual perception, relationship to the environment, and evaluation of the environment, as well as availability of resources. Furthermore, an individual's control over internal and external de demands has an impact on coping and change. Scope. The scope of the concept ranges from effective or adaptive coping to ineffective or maladaptive coping.
coping that results from constructive or destructive coping mechanisms. Coping behaviors result from a real or perceived stressor and are geared toward reduction or elimination of the stress. Constructive mechanisms occur when an individual treats the stressor as a warning and elects to resolve the problem. Destructive mechanisms occur when an individual addresses the feeling associated with the stressor without resolving the problem. This continuum is not necessarily one or the other. Some coping strategies may be partially effective or partially ineffective. Ineffective coping refers to the inability to assess the stressor and or respond appropriately. When coping is ineffective, many problems can result depending on the seriousness of the stressor event. The scope of coping is also viewed from the perspective of an individual, family, or community. Individual coping links to the coping capacity of an individual client and patient. Family coping refers to the coping ability of family members when faced with challenges with one or more family members. On a community level, coping refers to the adaptive patterns and problem-solving capacity of a community when faced with challenges. This concept presentation primarily focuses on individual coping. The coping process essential involves, essentially involves an assessment of the stressor, an assessment of the available resources to deal with the stressor, and then engagement through the adoption of one or more coping strategies. Outcomes are dependent on the effectiveness of the strategies selected. This is a complex, nonlinear process because of the multiple variables involved. Cognitive assessment. Responding to stress begins with a cognitive assessment or evaluation of the situation in relation to the individual. This assessment represents the process of sorting out information to derive meaning and is the underlying factor in how an individual will respond. There are two phases in cognitive assessment. The first involves primary appraisal or an additional evaluation to understand the situation. The individual evaluates the potential for harm to self or to a loved one's well-being, self-esteem, or personal values and may determine how much personal control can be exercised over the situation. Here, the individual evaluates the resources available to overcome, eliminate, or reduce the stressor and determines to what extent the problem is controllable. Therefore, primary and secondary appraisals require cognitive skills so that the stressor is accurately assessed and appropriate resources are identified. However, even with cognitive capacity, there can be wide variability in how a stressor is perceived and the access, recognition, and application of appropriate resources. Multiple variables influence perspectives for primary and secondary appraisals. One of the major influences is the characteristic and context of the stressful event, including perceived controllability. Key personal elements include level of education, past life experiences, current coping style, values and expectations, beliefs, self-efficacy, and worldviews. An individual's world is heavily influenced by his or her culture. A situation itself may or may not be perceived as stressful, depending on one's culture, and the response to an event is often culturally based, such as religious beliefs, social values, beliefs concerning the meaning or purpose of an event, and the individual's beliefs concerning his or her own purpose in life. Cultural beliefs such as shame, discrimination, gender constraints, help-seeking activities, and stigma may affect how the individual copes in a situation. Engagement. This is the second process which follows the cognitive assessment and refers to how the problem is addressed or the individual's engagement with the problem. In other words, the primary and secondary appraisal drive the action an individual takes to cope with the stressor. After an individual takes action, a reappraisal process is done where the individual evaluates which coping mechanisms were effective and which ones were not, leading to the process of adaptation or the incorporation of all coping processes to reach a new equilibrium or to return to the previous or normal state. Variations in context. There is little agreement in the literature regarding the classification of coping strategies in stressful situations. However, three predominant themes or common distinctions among the various strategies are problem-focused coping, emotion-focused coping, and meaning-focused coping. Problem-focused coping involves the cognitive process 
of evaluating the situation and then taking an action to manage or change the situation or circumstance. The focus is usually geared toward eliminating or reducing the underlying cause of the stressor. Emotion-focused coping emphasizes the regulation of emotional response that occurs. No attempt is made to address the situation or stressor. Rather, the focus is on controlling the emotional response as a result of the situation. Does not address the stressor. Meaning-focused coping involves a process whereby the individual draws on values, beliefs, and goals to modify the personal interpretation in response to a problem. Although individuals typically apply a combination of these strategies when coping with stress, research has shown that problem-focused approaches tend to be more effective than emotion-focused strategies, especially avoidance behaviors. Some situations, however, are beyond the control of an individual, so problem-focused approaches are not always reasonable or indicated. Inherent in these three categorical distinctions is the assumption that the individual is able to accurately appraise the situation and current resources and has the ability to determine an appropriate course of action that will produce change. The types of coping strategies can change depending on the perceived outcomes of the stressor and the perceived ability of resources. For example, when a role is threatened, the individual utilizes more of a problem-focused direct coping plan to relieve or eliminate the stressor. A second major distinction of coping is effective and maladaptive coping behaviors. Positive coping behaviors are those that address the underlying stressor and have a reasonable degree of success. Maladaptive coping behaviors are those that do not adequately address the underlying problem. Consequences. Consequences of poor coping can result in multiple issues, particularly for the individual already stressed. Specific consequences are difficult to describe because these are highly variable. It depends on the type and number of stressors involved, the way the stressors are perceived, the length of time that they've occurred, the type of coping mechanism, if any, implemented, and the degree of effectiveness and the resilience of the individual. Two individuals, pace, two individuals faced with the same stressor often have very different outcomes because of the variables. The consequences of poor coping can be physical, psychosocial, or both. Examples include a decline in physical health, development of mental health problems such as depression and anxiety, a reduction in functional ability, a change in social status, financial status, or relationships, and alterations in family dynamics. The type of coping strategy or resource one uses can have an effect on the outcome. The type Maladaptive coping responses often lead to physical health problems. The use of alcohol or drugs to escape the stressor can lead to self-injury or long-term consequences such as addiction. Likewise, failure to adequately respond to a stressor can result in health consequences as a result of the stressor itself. An individual who uses avoidance or denial will have far less favorable outcomes associated with the stressful event. In a study involving cardiac patients, Levine and others found that patients in denial were less likely to follow discharge instructions, such as adding an exercise regimen, and as a result, these patients had more rehospitalizations one year following the cardiac event. Avoidance as a coping strategy can be somewhat useful in situations that are perceived as short term and uncontrollable. However, avoiding the stressful event or feelings surrounding the stressful event can lead to increased emotional dis distress, longer recovery times, less effective problem solving, and maladaptive responses. Risk factors. All individuals use a variety of coping mechanisms throughout life, regardless of age, race, or gender. Although most individuals have effective coping mechanisms, there are risk factors associated with ineffective coping capacity. Those depend on how the individual perceives the stressful event and the ability to identify and use resources. Any perceived threat to self or loved one's well-being can be judged not only as a stressor, but also as a situation in which one has little control. The ability to determine what resources are available and how these resources can be utilized is essential for coping. Therefore, risk factors for poor coping link to one or more of the following. Inability to accurately assess the stressor. Denial or avoidance of the stressor an actual or perceived lack of control over the situation, an actual or perceived lack of support, 
no experience or poor past experiences handling stressful situations. Impaired cognition, limited cognitive functioning is a key risk factor for poor coping. How well an individual appraises the stressful event and utilizes available resources is central to positive outcomes. Individuals with poor cognition may also have limited experience managing stressful events and thus may not take any action either purposefully or as a form of denial. Limited psychosocial resources. Most researchers are in agreement that personality variables impact the perception of the stressor or stressful event, although there is controversy regarding how personality plays a role in coping. Individuals who have poor self-esteem or those who feel depressed and lack motivation to respond to stressors are at risk for poor coping. Hardiness is the individual's sense of control over the stressful events, coupled with commitment and challenge towards life events. Individuals who have a high degree of hardiness or resilience are generally better able to cope than those who have poor self-esteem. Those with limited physical or financial resources also are at greater risk for poor coping because they may be less able to access appropriate interventions. Children. Research on children's perception of stressful events is based on age and developmental stages, as well as the child's level of self-efficacy and self-control. Self-efficacy and self-control are challenged by chaos and loss of autonomy. Harsh experiences in childhood, including dysfunctional family dynamics, can lead to poor coping skills later in life. Studies have reported that younger children who are unexpectedly admitted to the hospital are usually at higher risk for poor coping. Also, children whose parents experience extreme amounts of stress also have shown poor coping behaviors. Adolescence. There is a well-established relationship between adolescent coping and high-risk behaviors. Adolescents who have poor or insufficient coping are at risk for drug use, high-risk sexual behaviors, psychological distress, and suicide. It's assumed that improving adolescent coping skills will result in changes in perception and reaction to stressors in different, more positive ways. There is relatively little research related to the measurement of coping among adolescents, and therefore, this is an area that requires additional exploration to further understand this concept. Older adults have unique risks for impaired coping compared to other age groups. Although they may have some advantage in coping experiences, many older adults may lack social supports or resources, may have less resilience because of health conditions, and may suffer from altered perceptions of stressful events, particularly if cognitive function is impaired. There is a tendency for older adults with Alzheimer's disease to select escape mechanisms and emotional strategies as opposed to actually solving the underlying problem. This underscores the importance of cognitive skills for adequate coping. Changes in health or chronic health conditions. Individuals confronted with serious health issues are also vulnerable to poor coping styles. Franks and Roche, R-O-E-S-H, reported that individuals in a chronic state of disease who view their disease in a positive manner were more likely to use coping strategies. However, individuals who viewed their disease negatively engaged in denial. Roche and Wiener also reported that individuals who perceived their disease as uncontrollable were prone to denial and avoidance. Assessment. Nurses learn that about an individual. Again, the actual measurement of coping is very difficult because of the complexity of this concept. In Box 32.1 on page 313 of Concepts, you have a list of coping measurement instruments that may be used to assess your patient. Clinical management. The clinical management of coping can be very complicated and challenging. Primary prevention strategies for coping are nonspecific and linked to general strategies that optimize wellness. Maintaining good health and proper nutrition, exercising, sustaining positive personal relationships and social support networks, and preserving positive self-esteem are all common mechanisms related to positive coping. Community-based support programs for situational stress stressors are described further. Collaborative interventions. <clears throat> Clinical management of an individual with ineffective coping is directed toward the reduction of perceived threats, 
and the reinforcement of perceived control over the stressor by adopting positive coping. As mentioned previously, there are three general categories of coping strategies, problem-focused coping, emotion-focused coping, and meaning-focused coping. Problem-focused coping strategies are most commonly applied when the stressor can be modified, changed, or controlled. These attempt to find solutions or improvements to the underlying stressor. Examples of problem-focused coping are newly diagnosed patient attending a patient education seminar to learn about optimal disease management or a caregiver gaining support through the access of community resources. Emotion-focused coping addresses the feelings one has as a result of the stressor. These strategies do not work toward a solution, but they can help create a feeling of well-being. Examples include performing physical activity to relieve stress associated with an overwhelming work schedule or attending a support group to discuss one's feelings. Meaning-focused coping strategies address an individual's personal values, beliefs, or goals and assumptions as a way to modify the personal interpretation and response to the stress. Examples include a patient who is willing to change a personal goal as a way to cope with a stressor. For example, a patient who has lost functional ability following a stroke may change his or her personal expectation about walking without the use of assistive devices. In many cases, a combination of problem-focused, emotional-focused, and or meaning-focused strategies are used. It is important to emphasize not all coping strategies are effective in all situations. Once these variables have been identified, the nurse can more efficiently help the patient choose a clinical management strategy that will best support his or her needs. Specific strategies include education, planning, assessing resources, and cognitive research restructuring. Education regarding the situation and alternative coping measures is a powerful tool to increase self-efficacy and control. The cancer patient who is educated about treatment alternatives and is given a choice of treatment will feel more in control of the situation. The nurse can then help the individual select emotion-focused coping strategies. When emotion-focused and problem-focused coping are used, there is a greater sense of positive coping. Developing an action plan. Another way to increase control and self-efficacy is to develop an action plan or coping plan with the individual. The nurse can assist the patient to consider various coping methods. In various situations, and develop an individualized plan. For example, the nurse might help the cancer patient identify several relaxation techniques or perhaps create a list of activities to complete when he or she is feeling better. The nurse may also help the individual to develop a list of tasks to accomplish while undergoing treatment, such as reading a book or learning to use a computer program, something that is interesting but not physically taxing. Assessing resources. Another important strategy is to identify and access supportive resource, resources that can help the individual. Such resources can range from a support group to a mentor or a clinical service. Resources may also be beneficial for the individual to discuss problem solving concerns or decision making ideas. Cognitive restructuring. Another potential strategy involves a cognitive restructuring of the stressor, the primary strategy of mental focus coping. This is referred to as positive reappraisal, seeing the stressor from a more positive viewpoint. When using this strategy, the nurse must understand and take into account the individual's worldview, which originates from the individual's values, beliefs, and culture. Positive appraisal has been shown to increase the individual's strategies for coping, sense of control, and perception of the stressor. This change in the perception in the stressor can lead to changes in emotions as well as behaviors toward the stressor and can increase the individual's ability to cope. For example, an individual suffering from panic attacks because of upcoming surgery may be asked to identify what aspects of the surgery he or she finds upsetting. The perception is likely negative. A patient may fear not waking up from surgery. In this situation, the nurse could inform the patient about the surgery and the strengths of the surgeon, as well as the success rate of the procedure. The nurse has added doubts to the perception of, I won't wake up from, the, the nurse has added doubt to the belief of, I won't wake up from the surgery.
The individual can then begin to turn the negative thinking into a more positive pattern of thought. The increased understanding can provide the patient with a greater sense of control and a much more positive perception of the upcoming surgery. Interrelated concepts. The concept of coping is multifaceted and involves the links to several interrelated concepts. Stress is a highly interrelated concept because coping is a stress response. Coping either is positive or it is a cause of stress if it's maladaptive. Although stress is usually viewed as a negative event, it can also be perceived as a positive attribute with individual control. The term stress and coping can be viewed as having an equal but different effect on a, on a person. Stress can be viewed as a situation requir requiring coping or it can result from negative coping methods. So coping is how the individual views and addresses the stressor. A second interrelated concept besides stress is the health and illness concept of cognition. Adequate cognitive skills are essential for primary and secondary appraisal. Individuals with poor appraisal capabilities may fail to recognize or actually perceive or accurately perceive situations requiring attention and thus making the situation worse. Additional concepts besides stress and cognition are culture, spirituality, and development. Each of these concepts influence how an individual perceives or frames an event shaped by the individual's developmental level and by the individual's value and belief system. Functional ability and family dynamics are additional concepts that link to coping strategies and can be the reason for poor coping. The concepts addiction, anxiety, and mood and affect are interrelated because they can result from maladaptive coping and they can also escalate poor coping strategies. Exemplars. Clinical exemplars of coping represent common coping behaviors from the extent of positive and maladaptive. It is important to differentiate coping behaviors as exemplars as opposed to consequences of maladaptive coping. To help clarify this, denial is an exemplar of an emotion-based maladaptive coping strategy and the consequence could be increased anxiety. Substance use is a maladaptive coping strategy that could lead to addiction. Social isolation is a maladaptive coping strategy that could lead to depression. Although it is beyond the scope of this concept to list all examples, Box 32-3 on page 314 are common examples of both types of responses. Relaxation techniques. One of the most common coping strategies is relaxation. Relaxation techniques reduce symptoms of stress by focusing one's attention on something calming and increasing body awareness. There are many types of relaxation techniques, but most include one or more of the following. Autogenic relaxation, which is an internal process using visual and body awareness to reduce stress. Progressive deep muscle relaxation, a focus on tension and relaxation of muscle groups. Imagery, a cognitive strategy whereby calming, peaceful, Mental images are used to cope with the situation and relaxed breathing, a process in which long, deep, purposeful breaths are taken slowly over a period of several minutes. Social support. Social coping represents a group of strategies that involve gaining support. This can take the form of friends or family members, a community group, a spiritual group, and support groups organized by specific problems such as cancer survivors support groups. Social support has been shown to improve self-esteem or emotional well-being by moderating the impact of stress. In addition to the improvement of emotional well-being, support groups usually help the individual make good decisions regarding actions to take in response to this problem. An exception to this is if the social support negatively influences behavior, such as codependency. Reframing. Reframing refers to a positive coping strategy characterized by purposefully uh, thinking about the problem in a positive aspect of the situation, in other words, finding the silver lining, or makes a cognitive decision to make the best of the situation. In this case, the meaning or interpretation of the situation is reframed to a more positive one. For example, a pianist who is coping with the functional loss of his hands now begin, begin to reframe the loss as an opportunity 
for a new career path, such as a music teacher or a piano tuner. Substance use, a very common maladaptive coping strategy is the use of drugs or alcohol as a means to cope with a variety of stress, particularly job-related stress or relationship-based stress. Substance use is considered a short-term coping strategy because it provides a temporary relief and it does not address the underlying problem. In many cases, the coping strategy can exacerbate or make worse the underlying problem if substance abuse escalates, creating an endless cycle of stress, use, relief, stress. If the substance use reoccurs over time, addiction can result. Avoidance coping. Avoidance coping is an emotion-focused, maladaptive coping whereby the behavior response is based on attempting to avoid the thoughts and or feelings associated with the situation. It can be demonstrated as doing things that are not helpful to a situation, such as washing dishes three times to address the fear of food poisoning, failing to respond in a timely manner, uh, delaying action to finish an unrelated task, or failure to do something, such as avoiding a conversation, when one is necessary. Regression is a maladaptive coping strategy whereby the individual reverts back to an earlier stage of development or a loss in functional status in an attempt to cope with the situation that's uncomfortable or frightening. For example, an adolescent may demonstrate clingy childlike behavior with a parent or other adult to cope with a significant disappointment, such as being rejected by a peer group. In response to an unexpected death of a spouse, an older adult may become dependent on others to carry out activities of daily living in which he or she is otherwise independent. Disassociation is an extreme example of an ineffective emotion-based coping behavior in which an individual adopts another representation or perspective of his or her self to cope with the situation. A, per a person who dissociates may lose track of time and demonstrate a change in thought processes and behaviors. Disassociation results in the individual adopting a disconnected view of him or herself in the individual's world. A person who disassociates checks out, quote unquote, or disconnects from the reality of events in the real world and opts for a world in a different dimension free of thoughts, feelings, or memories that are unbearable. Question, what is the key element associated with an examination of coping? Is it observation of behavior, psychological testing, physical examination, or assessment of vital signs? The answer should be observation of behavior. Next question, what powerful tool will increase self-efficacy and control for a person who is stressed? Will it be self-perception, denial, education, or maladaptive coping? So this could be self-perception, number one. Next question. Anger, anxiousness, sadness, and hopelessness are evidence of which coping type? Primary, positive, adequate, or poor? The answer should be poor. And this is the end of the slideshow.